Isaiah chapter 10. We actually began chapter 10 last week because we were finishing the section that began at chapter 9, verse 8, and we took it all the way to its conclusion. And I mentioned as we were doing that, reminded everyone, the chapter divisions we find in our Bible are a human invention. They're not divinely inspired. Somebody added them. And quite logically, somebody asked me after service, well, when did that happen? The short answer is that the, ch uh, the chapter divisions date back to the 1200s, 1200 AD, and the verses date back to 1400s for the Old Testament, 1500s for the New Testament. That's the short answer. There, there are longer answers. There were some earlier attempts to organize the Bible into, into different chunks. And, and parts of the Old Testament, and you know this, are, are organized into paragraphs or into thematic units just by the way that they're written. But the chapter and verse delineations that we're used to, that we see in our Bible, um, those date back not that long in, 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 you know, in the scope of how long we've had our Bible. 1200s for the chapters, 1400s, 1500s for the verses. A good resource for questions like that is a website called, appropriately enough, gotquestions.org. Gotquestions, one, altogether one word, dot org. I'm not saying don't ask me questions. Uh, I, ju I just don't want you to depend on me. And gotquestions.org is not Calvary, per se. And I don't agree with absolutely everything they say about absolutely everything they talk about. They have literally thousands of questions organized there. And if you ask one question, it'll, it'll pop up um, some other suggested topics. It's, it's a pretty, pretty, nice, uh, pretty nice site. There's some doctrinal stuff that, that I don't line up perfectly with. If you get into gifts of the Spirit, for example, we're going to deviate a little. But if you're, if you're looking for factual things, fact-based questions, they're really, really solid. But back to Isaiah chapter 10. As we left off, Isaiah was prophesying. The year is around 733 B.C. He's prophesying to King Ahaz of Judah. And he's prophesying, interestingly enough, about Israel. Why is that interesting? Well, Israel was the northern kingdom of the divided kingdom. Remember, after the death of Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam split the kingdom. This is around 930 B.C., so 200 years before Isaiah is speaking forth these, these prophecies. The kingdom was divided, and Isaiah was primarily a prophet to the southern kingdom. He's talking to King Ahaz, who was king of the southern kingdom, king of Judah. So it's odd that he would be speaking prophecies about Israel that Israel was never going to hear, but we noticed, if you look at chapter 10, verse 4, we'll just dial back one verse, we notice the repetition of a particular pair of uh, uh, phrases. For all of this, his anger is not turned away. There at the end of chapter 10, verse 4. But his hand, God's hand, is stretched out still. That phrase recurred four times in the passage that we looked at last week. And if you remember, if you were with us, we looked back at chapter 5 and we noticed that same couplet in chapter 5 referring to Judah. And we said, oh, we, okay, this, this makes sense. What God is saying is that he's going to judge Israel exactly this way and then he's going to judge Judah exactly the same way, the same way that he describes with the explicit, powerful, provocative language that he used all through chapter 9 and, and into chapter 10. The point of telling Isaiah and, and through Isaiah informing Ahaz and the rest of the southern kingdom, when I'm done judging Israel, this is the same treatment you're going to receive 
because you're guilty of all the same offenses. Continuing in verse 5 tonight, though, God changes the subject. And if you have a study Bible or a Bible with headers, you probably notice in my study Bible that says, Arrogant Assyria also judged. Even if you don't have that, verse 5 tips it off pretty quickly. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. The theme is still judgment. We get that because woe was the first word. But the object of God's judgment has changed. God is telling us when he's done chastening Israel, he's going to turn his wrath against Assyria. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now this gets a little confusing. Let's remember who we're talking about. When we're talking about Assyria, 8th century B.C., 700s B.C., Assyria is the 800-pound gorilla of the Middle East. They were the evil empire of their day. Often compared to the Nazi regime, gobbling up smaller countries, smaller states surrounding them. But what did we just read? We just read that this ruthless, violent, inhumane, brutal, expansionist regime is being used of God. God says the series, the staff in my hand, and the carnage, the, the slaughter, the displacement that they inflict on nations is God's judgment against those nations. Assyria is being used of God, used by God as an instrument of judgment, specifically here against Israel. Verse 5, an ungodly nation a nation that turned away from God. Remember Israel almost immediately when Israel and Judah separated, indulged in false worship and then idolatry. God is using Assyria, this brutal regime, bloodthirsty killers, as his instrument. That's perplexing. And what's more perplexing for many is that God is judging them for what? For doing what God wanted them to do. How does that make sense? God gives us the answer in verse 7. Yet he, he is Assyria, yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. He, Assyria, does not mean so. God is using them as his instrument, but that wasn't what Assyria thought it was doing. God was using Assyria, but that wasn't Assyria's plan. That wasn't their idea. They didn't believe in God. They're not following God, and certainly they weren't doing what they were doing for God. As far as they knew, they were serving themselves, and they were okay with that. They were serving themselves. They were indulging their pride, which makes it sin, and deserving of God's judgment. This is confusing, but it comes up often enough in Scripture, it's worth slowing down and making sure that we sort it out. God is sovereign over what? absolutely everything. God is sovereign over fill in the blank. And he's sovereign over it. God can't sin. He's incapable of doing evil. He's holy. He cannot do that which is unholy. But he can use sin. He can use evil. He can utilize unholiness for his purposes, and he does again and again through Scripture, right? 
cleanest example, at least the, the, the cleanest one that occurs to me tonight, flip over to Genesis 50, verse 20. Or you can just listen, because we're not going to be there long. But remember the story of Joseph. Joseph's brothers leave him for dead. It's an evil act. He ends up, you know the story, in a leadership position in Egypt. Functionally, we might say that he was prime minister of Egypt. Whatever his title, he was in a position to save his family years later from famine. And when his brothers come to him and say, oh, boy, did we blow it. We're so sorry. Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me. They meant evil and they did evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now, that story and that verse foreshadow what other story? What other historical event? The cross, yeah. Jesus, where Jesus' brothers, the Jewish people, he often refers to the Jewish people as his brothers, Jesus' brothers, hand him over to be killed. But his death left us in a position to be saved, to be sheltered. And not only us, the church, but eventually Israel as well. We'll talk about that before we're done tonight. And actually, along the way, now that I think about it, there's another example of God using evil to accomplish his purposes. What am I thinking of? Judas. Prophesied in Scripture that Judas would betray Jesus. Evil that God didn't orchestrate, but God knew would happen, and said, okay, I can use that. I can work with that. I can allow that to accomplish the thing that I intend. So back to Isaiah. Assyria, God tells us, they're not angels. They're not, they're not angels of judgment like we see in Revelation that God sends on a mission. Assyria isn't sent by God with a, with a briefing package saying this is your mission, go accomplish these things. No, they're serving themselves. They're satisfying their own appetite for conquest. Verse 8. Verse 8? Yeah, verse 8. It's just on this page. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? He's naming Syrian cities, speaking, as it were, for Assyria. These are Syrian cities vanquished by Assyria in the mid-700s B.C., one after the other. And the Assyrian, according to Isaiah, the Assyrian, the Holy Spirit says, looks at them as, as, as all the same. One's the same as the other. They're no different from one another. They're all weak. And you know what? He continues in verse 10. They've got better gods than Israel and Judah. As my hand has found the kingdom of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I've done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not also do to Jerusalem and her idols? I've conquered all of these Syrian cities and city-states. And they had really amazing idols. I mean, you wouldn't believe the carving on some of these things. And oh, the temples. The, the, the temples, the idols that the, that the Jews have, they're, they're, they're paltry in comparison. I beat their gods, I'm going to beat their god. Nothing is going to stop the Assyrian. And, and just to get some color on the Assyrian mentality, the Assyrian mindset, came across some writing a hundred years earlier from an earlier Syrian king, Assyrian king. 
who wrote this. This is from secular history, not from Scripture. In these days, when at the command of the great gods my lordly sovereignty has manifested itself, going forth to plunder the goods of the land, I am royal. I am lordly, lordly. I am mighty. I am honored. I am exalted. I am glorified. I am powerful, all powerful. I am brilliant. I am lion brave. I am manly. I am supreme. I am noble. You put that on a post it note and just use it for your morning affirmations. <laughs> Nothing wrong with his self esteem, right? That's the Assyrian mindset a hundred years earlier when they had barely begun embarking on this campaign of conquest. It's almost satanic pride, if you think about it. Remember that as we keep going. How does God view pride? Verse 12, therefore it shall come to pass. So Isaiah is not speaking for the Assyrians anymore. This is, this is Isaiah speaking for God. It shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, the Assyrian says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people and robbed their treasures. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found the nest uh, has found like in the nest uh, riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I've gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. God is going to judge the Assyrian for his pride and for the fruit, the outworking of his pride. These brutal conquests. The Assyrian says, and this is what God can't abide. By the strength of my hand, I have done it. It almost sounds like I can be like the Most High. God's answer, verse 15, shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. God says, you're like the axe or the saw bragging about how many trees you cut down. Apart from the lumberjack, you'd sit on the ground or you'd hang on the shed or you'd lean against a tree forever. We depend on God for every breath, right? I mean, literally... Scientists, if they're honest about it, will confess that, that something supernatural is involved in every cell division. Think back to biology. When, when, when that first cell is, is, is that first, the egg is first fertilized, and then it splits into two, and then it splits into four, and then it splits into eight, and at some point they begin to specialize the DNA in that fertilized egg has the information necessary to become any type of cell in the human body, from liver to eye to heart to lung to pancreas. What tells the cell what to become? What, what signals that cell to specialize? Or should I say, who signals that cell? Atoms. In the center of an atom are protons, right? Protons and neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. Protons are positively charged. Like charges repel, don't they? What holds an atom together? God is literally holding the universe together with his love. And we forget that at our peril. And we do forget that sometimes. I was praying with some, some people not long ago, and it, 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 
and I'm not hanging the, the, the individual for, for their words, but it, was, it, just, it just caught my attention. How often we, we pray, God, help me. God, help me pass this test. God, help me get this loan. God, help me uh, make this decision. God, help me. Again, I don't want to be legalistic and caught up on language. Isaiah just got done telling us it's, it's the heart. It's the motive that Assyria had. And, and God is always concerned with our motive. But, but what is our heart and what is our motive? When we say, God, help me, are, 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 are we saying, it's worth asking, I'm most of the way there, God. I just need a little, a little push to get over the finish line. God, just give me that, that secret sauce, that, that extra twist. Or are we praying from weakness? Are we praying from a, from a place of humility, a place of recognizing God? Apart from you, I can do no good thing. Back to Isaiah. For the Assyrian, it's all pride all the time. Therefore, verse 16, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones. And under his glory he will kindle a burning, like the burning of a fire. So the light, of the, uh, the light of Israel will be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. It will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. Judgment against the Assyrians, specifically against the Assyrian army. And I love that last image, the idea there. The number of soldiers left standing will be the, like, like the number of trees a child draws when a child draws a forest. Think about your kids with the big old Crayolas in their hands. I'm going to draw a forest, Dad. How many trees are on the page when they're done? That's, that's the picture God gives us, that, the vivid image of the destruction he's going to bring against this marauding army. Question, when does that happen? The prophecy is being spoken, again, 733 B.C., give or take. But when is the prophecy fulfilled? I think the passage gives us two answers. And Isaiah's already hinted at both. Skip down to verse 28, and we'll look at the first one. He has come to Aeth, he's past Migron. At Mishmash, he's attended to his equipment. They've gone along the ridge. They've taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galam. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish. O poor Anathoth. Medmena has fled. The inhabitants of Geban seek refuge. And yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Could we pull that map up, folks in the booth? What we just read is a description of Sennacherib's army in 701 B.C. making his way down from the north and assaulting Judah. City by city, it describes the route that history says that Sennacherib took. Each of those cities, he's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. And, and with, with each step with each measure of progress, more and more panic, more and more fear being incited in the people of Jerusalem. But when they get there, verse 32, all they can do, all Sennacherib and his army can do is shake their fist. Verse 33, behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He'll cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Keep a finger here. Flip over to 2 Kings chapter 19. The prophecy that we're reading in this chapter, 
is literally fulfilled, is first fulfilled with Sennacherib's advance on Jerusalem in 701 B.C. We read about it on Isaiah 37, so in a few weeks we're going to read about it, but we also read about it in 2 Kings 19. Let's start around verse 32, where the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, no, come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. He shall not come into this city, says the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Verse 35, it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. So that's the first fulfillment. Keep, keep a finger, by the way, in, in 2 Kings 19, if, if you don't mind. Notice the, 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 the imagery that the Holy Spirit uses back in Isaiah. Verse 15, Assyria thought they were the axe. Verse 19, God says, no, I'm going to cut the forest down. And then verse 34, he fulfills the promise, he decimates the forest. So we have every reason to say, the answer to your question, Patrick, is 701, 701 B.C. It's Sennacherib. But wait, there's more. 701 B.C., perfectly valid answer, but there's another answer as well. And the first clue to the second answer, not in either or, this is a both and, is in Isaiah 10, verse 5. I don't know if you noticed this. Not verse 5. Uh. Bear with me. Verse 12. Sorry about that. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. Did that catch anyone's attention the first time we read it through? When the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem... What is the Holy Spirit talking about here? Before you answer that question, answer this question. Is there any possibility that all the Lord's work was finished? All of his work for Jerusalem was finished in 701 B.C.? I don't think so. We know that he still had work to do, let's say, in 30 A.D., give or take, when Jesus hung on a cross in Jerusalem, I think that work was still outstanding in 701 BC. So that gets us closer. But I still don't think that that's all the work that God has to do in Jerusalem. Because if all his work in Jerusalem were finished in 30 AD, give or take, well then Jesus wouldn't return to Jerusalem, would he? I think all work, all the work that the Holy Spirit is referring to here, isn't fulfilled, isn't completed until the believing remnant of Israel at the end of the tribulation finally confesses their national sin and calls on the name of the Lord. Remember Jesus told them, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We read the details in Zechariah, we'll see some discussion of it in Isaiah as well during our study. When a believing remnant that I think is in Petra at this point, but we'll talk about that when we get there, calls on the name of the Lord, calls on the name of Jesus, acknowledges him as their Messiah, and confesses the sin of handing him over to be executed. Jesus returns. And when he returns, what's his first order of business? Verse 
he stops Antichrist's army from advancing on Jerusalem. Look at verse 17. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. Who does that have to be talking about? Jesus. Jesus, who not for nothing, John calls the light of the world. If he's the light of the world, certainly he's the light of Israel. Certainly he's the Holy One. I, I, I said keep a finger in 2 Kings 19. And I didn't. But just because it's Wednesday night, Dakota is teaching second kings or was recently teaching second kings in junior high and he asked me an interesting question recently second kings 1935 it came on a, to pass on a certain night that the angel of the lord went out and killed in the camp of the assyrians 185,000. and he said wait a minute isn't the angel of the lord usually i mean not always but usually point to an old testament appearance of jesus and I said, yeah, that's a decent rule of thumb. I think, I think there are some exceptions, but yeah. He said, so is this one of the exceptions, or is that Jesus in 2 Kings 19 slaying the 185,000? And I wasn't sure what to think. But the fact that that foreshadows an event in which Jesus most certainly does show up leading an army from heaven and ends up covered with his enemy's blood, yeah, I think it's possible. I don't know for sure, but I think it's possible. If you're not convinced that we've suddenly looked at a long-term fulfillment of this prophecy, go back to Isaiah 10, and let's look at the passage that we skipped. Verse 20, it shall come to pass in that day. That's the phrase that makes us stop and say, wait a minute. That signals us that we're talking about the day of the Lord. In that day. Phrases like that in prophetic scripture are almost 100% of the time signal us that we're talking about the, the period of time, the day of the Lord, that begins... With anti, well, begins with the, tribula uh, with, the, with the rapture, continues through the tribulation, and then through the millennial kingdom. It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, verse 20, and such as have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. If the beginning of the verse didn't convince you that this was long-term prophetic, the end of it should. When... Since this prophecy was spoken, did Israel not depend on other nations? When did they not serve other nations or even in our day rely on other nations? Answer never. This has to be future. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, that was the promise to to, to Abraham, a remnant of them will return, a small, small percentage of Jews will drop to their knees and confess Jesus. The destruction decree shall overflow with righteousness, sounds like Jesus, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all of the land. Also sounds a lot like Revelation 19. Many more Jews will perish under the persecution of Antichrist than were executed during the Holocaust. But when the days seem darkest, when all hope is extinguished, a believing remnant will cry out in faith and in repentance and, and confess, we were wrong to align ourselves with Antichrist. We were wrong to believe his promises. We were wrong to trust in any man and any leader. We trust in God and God alone. At which point Jesus returns and destroys Antichrist's army. But, but, but Patrick, it says, it says the Assyrian. Okay, remember Joseph and Jesus. Jesus. 
just as Joseph was a real person, taken into real captivity, real slavery, and then elevated to a position of leadership, he was also at the same time a type, a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus, a suffering servant left for dead, elevated to a position of leadership, a position from which he can protect his family. Same thing, Sennacherib, real Assyrian leader, led a real military campaign against Judah in 701 BC, only to, only to be pushed back, only to have his army destroyed by the Lord. Also a picture of Antichrist, whose army is destroyed, but Antichrist survives to be thrown into the lake of fire, right? Both leaders of evil empires, both armies decimated, both survive after being used of God. After being used of God for the exact same purpose to chasten his people. Why does God let Sennacherib advance on Judah? To chasten them. To challenge them to repentance. Why does God allow Antichrist to consolidate such power? It is the only thing that brings Israel to her knees. It drives Israel to repentance. God uses Antichrist? Yeah, God doesn't waste. God uses Antichrist, he uses Judas, he uses Sennacherib. And he judges those he uses for their sin. All of which is why, verse 24, God encourages his people through this prophecy. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian or of Antichrist. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt, like Pharaoh, in other words, for yet a very little while and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. Even in judgment, God remembers mercy. And the Lord of hosts will set up, uh, sorry, stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. That's the story of Gideon, right? As his rod was on the sea, so he will lift it up in the manner of Egypt. There'll be another exodus, another deliverance. It'll come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. That's maybe my favorite part. Because the amillennialist who thinks that God is done with Israel, who doesn't believe in a literal tribulation or a millennial kingdom, has no idea what to do with verse 27, anointing oil. And you can read all kinds of fanciful conjectures. What is that pointing to? Is that the fat of the animal used for the sacrifice that when it's heat? No. It is what it, what it appears to be. Anointing oil in Scripture points us to God the Holy Spirit who moves on the hearts of the Jewish people and stirs them to repentance. It's so good, right? So what do we do with this? Other than shake our heads and say, man, the Word of God is amazing. And the God who wrote it is amazing. You can do a lot of things with this. The thing about God's word, there's one interpretation. And sometimes that interpretation is layered the way it is tonight. There's a short-term fulfillment, a long-term fulfillment, but there's still one correct interpretation. But that understanding, that correct understanding, gives birth to infinite applications. Infinite so what's. So what does this have to do with me? So, so, so what do I do with this in my life? There's as many different applications as there are people. More than that, because, because any one of us, what God speaks to us from this passage today might be different than what he says to us next year when we're, when we're back reading it again. Even one day to, to another, I was reading this passage Monday, reading it, studying it, getting ready to teach it, and you know, the, 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 the singular application God spoke to me out of it Monday was that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And, 
not hard to guess why. I had a friend who, who was really badly treated by his employer that day, and I had spent some time, you know, talking with him and praying with him, and, and, and you know, as, as much as I was saying, you know, God will work this out for good and all the things that you say, my heart was like, I just want to burn the place to the ground. I want me some justice. I, I read, I read, I read too many books about people taking justice into their own hands, I think. But, you know, the Lord used this, this passage to speak to me. And, 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 and he said, Patrick, I judge nations. I let the Assyrians off the leash to accomplish my will, but when they were done, I judged them. If I can judge nations and empires, I can judge individual people in Wichita. Just, just chill. That, 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 that was God and me having, having a little moment on this passage on Monday. But yesterday... I'm back in the passage, I'm reading again, I'm studying again, I'm praying over it again. And the Holy Spirit zeroes in my heart on, on verse 7. When God says it's about motive. I was using the Assyrians, but the Assyrians didn't think that that's what they were doing. God is always concerned with the heart. He judges the heart. Not a new idea. But God brought me back around and he said it's still an important idea. And he reminded me that, that we can teach the word, disciple believers, counsel couples, launch ministries, lead people to the Lord. But if the motive is not to serve the Lord, if the heart is not to glorify the Lord, what happens when we haul those, those, those accomplishments before the Bema Seat of Christ? They burst into flame. Only things done with the right motive endure to heaven. Only things done for the Lord earn crowns. If, 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 if we're doing it for our own identity, to build our self-esteem, to prove something to someone, to win friends, to impress parents, to, to get a gig or keep a gig, oh, that burns up. That's wood, hay, and stubble. And... and specifically what the Lord was, was pointing me to is sometimes after a challenging service or a challenging ministry event, maybe things don't go as planned, maybe things completely blow up. <laughs> sometimes we'll say to each other, well, you know, people heard the word. Well, you know, prayer happened. People were really worshiping at least. Okay, that's great, but that's to God's credit. It's, 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 it's the nature of God's word that it doesn't return void. It's, it's, it's no credit to us. And the Holy Spirit stirs people to pray. And the Holy Spirit stirs worship. God is sovereign. The, the question we should be asking ourselves, and this is what God was laying on me, is, is at the end of a service, at the end of a ministry event, at, at, at the end of any day in God's kingdom, was my heart tender before the Lord? I don't care, you know, no one prayed, no one worshipped. No one read verse 1. Okay, was my heart given over to serve the Lord? Was my motivation His glory? The metaphor we used Sunday. Was I picturing myself on the stage? Or was I running the spotlight? And was I content to run the spotlight? and point people to Jesus. It, applications. Those are a couple of mine. Two applications for, from two days sitting with this passage. What's yours? What is God saying to you? I'd encourage you to ask that question anytime you get into the Word. Anytime you get into the Word. Your daily devotional reading. Try to not put it down until you know the so what that, that God brought you into that passage to speak. It's, it's great. I mean, it really is. It's good and it's great to be amazed at God's word, at the design and the intricacy and the beauty of God's word. It's also important to remember, not only is God's word amazing, it's living and yeah, there are always things that are cool. But what is the living word saying to you?
be jealous for that answer when you open your Bible. Lord, thank you for your word because it is amazing and you are amazing. You fulfill your word perfectly. Prophecy is history written specifically, knowingly, perfectly in advance. And that prophecy tells us you are who you say that you are. And who you are is a God who loves us. Who you are is a God who desires to lead us. Who you are is a God who sent his son to die to have a relationship with us. You are God who wants to speak to us. And so we thank you for this time, Lord, and pray that you'd continue speaking to us throughout the remainder of our week and the remainder of our days until Jesus does return. We look forward to that day, Lord. And we pray Jesus come quickly. In your holy and precious name, amen. Let's stand. We'll close our service in praise. Pastors and elders will be hanging out. Love to talk to you, pray with you, answer questions that you might have about anything at all whatsoever. But let's love the Lord in song before we do.